Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending today's session, Administrative Tribunal Litigation and Mental Health. Today's session will run about 50 minutes with time at the end to answer your questions. Please post any questions in the chat box. We have received a tremendous response to this webinar and we are hosting a large audience. If you experience technical difficulties, we suggest you exit the meeting and re-enter it, re it using the link provided in the email. Rest assured that LexisNexis will distribute a recording of today's session in a follow-up email. Now we will meet today's presenters. Anita Segetti is recognized as Canada's leading expert in mental health law. She has litigated thousands of mental health cases at the tribunal level and on appeals at all levels of court for 30 years in Ontario and since 2014 in Nunavut. She is a widely published author, teacher, and sought after speaker on any topic related to mental health and the law. Dr. Ruby Dand is a full professor at the, at the Faculty of Law at Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops, British Columbia. Dr. Dand is an award-winning teacher in the areas of human rights law, health law, mental health law and policy, and disability law in Canada. She started a student-run legal clinic to afford representation to individuals in mental health law matters and has won teaching awards throughout her career. Maya Shukeri is a criminal defense lawyer. She is a sole practitioner focusing exclusively on criminal and quasi-criminal matters. Her practice is based in Ottawa. Maya speaks French, English, and Arabic, and serves as a member of the governing bodies of various organizations, including as Assistant Secretary of WICCD, a newly formed Association for Women in Canadian Criminal Defense. I will now turn it over to Maya, who will be moderating today's event. Welcome, everyone. As you've heard, I'm a criminal defense lawyer and I practice uh, in the Ontario Court of uh, Justice and the Superior Court uh, uh, Superior Court of Ontario. And I will start by asking my first question to Anita. Anita, how would you describe the proceedings at administrative tribunals uh, to me? How are they different from uh, criminal trials? Thank you, Maya, for that question, and welcome everyone today. Thank you so much for your interest in mental health justice. We are blown away by, by the attendance. So um, administrative tribunal hearings are more informal than criminal courts that you may be used to. The strict rules of evidence do not apply in terms of what type of evidence is admissible or excluded. Most administrative tribunals, for example, can receive hearsay evidence and then the parties can argue about the weight to be assigned to that evidence. But many of the traditional rules of evidence that you rely on in court, such as authenticating evidence, do not apply at the tribunal level. The litigation that happens at the tribunal level is also less legal, in a sense. There's generally less reliance on precedent or case law, and more will turn on the specific facts. Administrative tribunals do not necessarily include lawyer members, let alone judges. Some do, and most mental health tribunals do, but they also have other members who have no legal training, such as medical or psychiatric professionals or lay persons. Administrative tribunal hearings are generally available quickly or earlier than you could get a court date. These hearings will happen in boardrooms, in offices, or in hospitals, or wherever makes sense for the litigation. And these days, most often virtually. There is no formality like robing or prescribed court procedures or bowing. You're probably sitting down the whole time, including when you make submissions. It's all meant to be accessible, informal, speedy, and a kind of quick and dirty justice, but presided over by subject matter experts whose decisions are accorded significant deference on appeal. There are a lot of variations across the tribunals in Canada in terms of process, due process, and natural justice protections we take for granted in superior courts and at trials. For example, tribunals may or may not deliver reasons for their decision, or they may or may not do so in writing, depending on their own rules, which most are permitted to make in accordance with some provincial statutory powers and procedures legislation. Some proceedings may not be recorded. Where there's no record, appeals or reviews are very difficult, even where notionally available. Appeal rights vary from none to broad statutory rights of appeal, 
inter uh, interpretation may or may not be available at the tribunal's expense during the hearing. And importantly for our purposes, there may not be legal representation available for vulnerable parties to tribunal proceedings, depending on the particular provinces and territories legal aid plans. Both civil and forensic mental health matters are addressed before administrative tribunals in Canada. And unfortunately, throughout most of the country, legal aid and lawyers are not available to the person with a mental health issue at the center of the controversy, or at least counsel of choice who has a meaningful opportunity to prepare is not available. Some places offer duty counsel type assistance throughout a full day of hearing, for example, through a local legal aid or student run legal clinic. We say that that type of assistance is likely not sufficient for most vulnerable clients whose liberty is by definition at stake in these mental health proceedings. Thank you, Anita. Uh, Ruby, my next question is for you. Uh, so now that we've heard a bit about administrative tribunals generally, how can you tell us, or can you tell us how civil mental health matters are adjudicated in Canada? Thank you so much, Maya, and thank you so much, Anita, and thank you to LexisNexis for organizing this incredible event and to everybody. I'm incredibly honored to be here. Unlike in the U.S., where commitment proceedings are brought by the state district attorney before a judge, Canada deals with mental health matters provincially, and each province enacts its own mental health act, which is adjudicated before tribunals. On the civil mental health side, each province and territory has its own admin tribunal to adjudicate hearings involving involuntary psychiatric admissions to hospitals, capacity to consent to treatment or to manage property and psychiatric treatment in the community. So here in BC and in Alberta, both those tribunals are called mental health review boards. In Ontario, as Anita mentioned, it's known as a consent and capacity board. And the hearings are held based on a patient application process rather than mandatorily, except for at certain time intervals, like once every six months or annually, depending on the province. So those patients who are too vulnerable to apply in will often not have their situation reviewed in a timely manner, or in some cases, not at all. On the upside, hearings are convened very quickly once an application is received in Ontario within seven days, for instance. And using Ontario and the CCB as an example, the Consent and Capacity Board, for instance, I'm going to mention how that works. Each panel usually has three members, a lawyer, a psychiatrist, or another medical practitioner, and a member who is not a lawyer or a psychiatrist. The parties to the hearing are the physician and the individual. The onus of the hearing is on the physician to prove on a balance of probabilities that the legislative requirements are met for involuntary admission or to have the individual found incapable of consenting to treatment or whatever the specific issue may be. Both parties have the right to present evidence, cross-examine witnesses, make submissions, and be represented by counsel. And the patient applicant is not a compelable witness. There is generally a time cap on these hearings, and on, in Ontario, it's currently two hours. The board has to provide their decision within 24 hours of the end of the hearing, and if requested, reasons from the board are due within four business days. Any appeal from the board to the Superior Court must be filed within seven days from the last from the date of the decision. So everything moves very quickly, or it's at least intended to do so. And the affected individual is entitled to a hearing each time they are put on a new form, detaining them involuntarily in hospital, and once every six months to a review of a finding of incapacity to consent to their own treatment. Those subject to, to community treatment orders also have the right to challenge those orders each time they are issued or renewed, usually once every six months. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ruby. Anita, now that we've heard a bit about how civil mental health matters are adjudicated, can you tell us about hearings uh, that review the situation of those found unfit and not criminally responsible by reason of mental disorder under our criminal code in Canada? Sure. Um, so we're now talking about uh, the so-called criminal code review boards. Um, part 20.1 of the criminal code contains the so-called mental disorder provisions. 
they govern what happens to individuals charged with criminal offenses who are found either unfit to stand trial or not criminally responsible in relation to the charges they face or criminal conduct. Once one of these two oh. findings is made by a court, the accused is transferred from the court's jurisdiction to the provincial or territorial criminal code review board's jurisdiction. The board will then meet at least annually to review the accused case and to decide what type of disposition the accused should be on and what conditions should be included in that disposition. Um, and Anita, can you tell us please who is on the board? The board is considered an expert tribunal. Each hearing uh, panel has at least three presiding members with at least one lawyer and one psychiatrist. In Ontario, the review board sits as a panel of five, usually with a chairperson who's most often a retired judge uh, or someone more than 10 years at the bar, certainly, which is a requirement, a public member, uh, a legal member, uh, a psychiatrist, and a psychologist. Okay, and who appears at the accused um, annual hearing? So the parties to criminal code review board hearings, the statutory parties are the person in charge of the forensic psychiatric hospital that's detaining or supervising the accused and the unfit or NCR accused. Uh, funnily enough, although the Crown will attend in Ontario at every hearing, perhaps not in other provinces or territories, the Crown is not a statutory party to these proceedings, but often they get leave uh, to appear. And as I see in Ontario, it permanent standing, so they're always there. Um, the board can appoint counsel for the accused if the accused does not have a lawyer. Uh, all parties can call evidence. They can cross-examine another party's witnesses, and they can make their own written or oral submissions to the board. The accused is not a compellable witness. The board will typically receive a hospital report setting out the accused's history, their progress under the board over the last year, and the hospital's recommendation as to disposition. Okay, and what happens at the hearings? So, compared to court proceedings, as we've been chatting about, hearings before these review boards are much less formal. And unlike the criminal court system, which is adversarial in nature, the review board system is inquisitorial, which means that the board has a responsibility to seek out and consider evidence favoring the accused person's discharge from the board or uh, their release from hospital with minimal conditions. When the issue is fitness, the board must determine whether the accused is still unfit to stand trial. If the board finds that the accused is still unfit, then the board must impose a disposition with conditions. But if the board finds that the accused is fit to stand trial, the board will refer that matter back to the criminal court. In the case of an NCR accused, the board must determine whether the accused poses a significant threat to the safety of the public. If the accused is not a significant threat, then the board must grant the accused an absolute discharge, which ends the board's jurisdiction over the accused and they're completely free. If the accused is found to pose that significant threat to the safety of the public on an ongoing basis, then the board has to impose a disposition with conditions. There are two types of dispositions that the board can impose for either an unfit accused or an NCR accused who poses a significant threat, a conditional discharge or a detention order. The disposition options are set out in section 672.54 of the criminal code. Okay, and how does the board decide what type of disposition or conditions to include? So the board is required to craft a disposition that is the least onerous and least restrictive of the liberty of the accused um, and is necessary and appropriate in the circumstances. So the board has to figure out what conditions are necessary to manage the accused person's risk while balancing not only the safety of the public, but also the fair treatment of the accused, including the accused mental condition, the accused reintegration into society, and the other needs of the accused. The board must then provide its disposition and reasons for that disposition to all of the parties 
and the accused is bound by that disposition until their next annual hearing. Reasons must be delivered in a timely manner and the parties can appeal directly to the court of appeal on any issue of law or fact within 15 days from the receipt of those reasons. Thank you, Anita. I still have another question for you, and it's can you give us your thoughts on the pros and cons of mental health matter uh, proceeding before the specialized administrative tribunals versus uh, hearing, hearing them in trial courts? Um, right, so the, the biggest comparative advantage is probably speed in terms of access to the tribunal. To have a hearing within a week of applying for a review of your situation if you're involuntarily detained is pretty quick. At the same time, the biggest drawback is how quick the hearings themselves are. With no more than two hours allotted in both the civil and the review board hearing processes. So if you've ever seen the movie Miracle on 34th Street, a Christmas classic with Natalie Wood, what I like to say about that movie is the biggest miracle in the whole thing is that there was a week long trial held in front of a judge in a trial court where the prosecution bore the onus of proving that the older gentleman claiming to be Santa Claus was not the real Santa Claus, in fact, in order to get him committed to a psychiatric facility. So that whole process in Canada is reduced to the stroke of a physician's pen, filling out a form to detain you in the hospital. And then if you have the wherewithal to do so, you can ask for a review of that decision, and then you'll be given two hours in front of an administrative tribunal um, at most to test all of the evidence against you and to make your own case. It's often just not enough time. Similarly, with relaxed rules of evidence, while that helps the vulnerable person who can put in hearsay and testify about whatever they want without really any constraints, it also works against the person when evidence against them is admitted, regardless of its reliability, where even tangentially relevant and not necessarily all that material. Evidence against persons with psychiatric histories is also often hugely prejudicial with little relative probative value, but gets admitted anyway in these proceedings for you know, completeness or because the tribunal simply doesn't want to waste hearing time arguing about it or ruling on such evidentiary issues. The expertise of the tribunal also cuts both ways. It allows for administrative efficiency because each psychiatric term does not have to be defined. Everyone in the room knows what schizophrenia is and what antipsychotic medications are, for example, where an expert would otherwise have to educate a judge or a jury about some or all of this. So in that respect, it's a plus. However, the psychiatric expertise within the panel, for example, is likely going to work against the person with the psychiatric history because that expertise can fill in the gaps in evidence uh, from the treating psychiatrist, whether in the hearing process by asking the questions that assist the testifying psychiatrist to supplement their evidence and shore up their case, or perhaps in the panel's deliberation. So in that regard, it's often unhelpful for our clients who would as often as not, if not more so, do better with a lay panel or with a judge who doesn't necessarily bring that clinical knowledge or perspective to the case. So those would be my you know, main points in comparing the systems. Uh, thank you, Anita. Now uh, to you, Ruby. So we know that COVID-19 has had a significant impact on all aspects of the justice system. Uh, how has it affected litigation before these mental health tribunals, both for the tribunals and for the parties appearing before them? Thanks so much, Maya, for that excellent question. During COVID-19, tribunals that consider civil mental health matters like involuntary committal have seen a very significant increase in their caseload. CCB stats, for instance, show an increase of about 25% in both applications and hearings when compared to pre-pandemic numbers, for example. 
Because of lockdowns, most tribunals switched to electronic hearings and most have never returned to in-person hearings. The CCB began by doing all phone hearings and is now switching to video, where the ORB switched to Zoom right away. Both remain 100% virtual as a default mode of hearing. As a result, as new staff come on board and replace previously appointed board members, many adjudicators have never been to a psychiatric facility, and prior to the pandemic, these hearings were held at the hospital and the board members got a really good sense of what these places are like. Now many board members are just not directly familiar with the conditions of detention. This could have a significant impact on their decision making. Okay, uh, and Ruby. Uh... Now, you have told us how conducting their hearings virtually has impacted the tribunals, but let's talk about it from the perspective of litigants. Um, what are some barriers to accessing remote hearings uh, for marginalized communities generally? Thanks so much, Maya. This is such an important question. So Anita and I wrote a paper about this early on in the pandemic, and it's called Litigating in the Time of Coronavirus, Mental Health Tribunal's Response to COVID-19. It was published in the Windsor Yearbook of Access to Justice in 2020. It does address many of these issues for your reference. So the first barrier to access is resource-based and often financial. Uh, Low-income people and homeless people all face the same barriers to any electronic hearing, as they don't have computers, often they don't may not have access to laptops, iPads, or smartphones, and this is sometimes a barrier to even telephone hearings, let alone Zoom hearings. This means that some clients cannot participate in the privacy of their own homes, but at the very least, they have to attend at the hospital or elsewhere to gain access to the computer or a phone, and that requires the cooperation of other parties to facilitate that access. Okay, and Ruby, beyond what marginalized communities generally experience, uh, are there any barriers to accessing remote hearings specifically uh, for individuals with mental health issues? Yes, so Ontario's Court of Appeal considered some of these issues in one particular context. In the case of Woods at the Ontario Court of Appeal, the case was released March 29, 2021, it considered whether an NCR accused has the right to an in-person hearing or rather the right to refuse a video hearing. And based on the applicable provision of the criminal code, the court said yes. In the process, the court pronounced that it is not prepared to find that virtual hearings in place of in-person hearings are merely a procedural irregularity, especially where the rights of vulnerable persons are an issue during a time of crisis. The Crown's position was that remote hearings do not impact the exercise of the procedural or substantive rights of the accused as they allow for meaningful participation. The court rejected this suggestion and the courts expressly found that for some people experiencing mental health issues, the forced use of video conferencing could contribute to anxiety or paranoia relating to the use of technology. The court also held that the use of technology should be used to enhance access to justice, not inhibit it. And tribunals must re remain vigilant about the risk that COVID-19 protocols could erode the fairness of the decision-making process. So in addition to difficulty in maintaining focus, and as we know on Zoom, since there's those tiny squares of talking heads on a video screen, especially if when you may be experiencing other visual distractions at the same time, there are practical considerations that impede access to justice. For instance, body language is 90% of communication. And for our clients, having their lawyer with them in the hearing room and in person is very important. They bring in their documents to the hearing, they need reassurance during the hearing, they want to see and experience everyone's reaction to the evidence. That's one reason where Phone hearings in particular, while not visually distracting, are even harder to maintain focus and provide a very less meaningful hearing experience for a lot of our clients. In-person hearings are far more important for persons with mental health issues than for other people and should be the default mode of hearing wherever possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ruby. And I actually so wanted to ask you, how are tribunals approaching then the issue of making sure persons uh, with mental health issues can participate meaningfully in electronic hearings or seek in-person hearings when possible? Thank you. 
there is that challenge of the onus being on the individual to seek in-person hearings. And where audio or video is a default and the person would prefer an in-person hearing, they may not, they may have to make an application to actually explain why. And the difficulty in having to rely on mental health issues as the reason to request this accommodation is the potential prejudice that would and could attach to making the request and disclosing mental health issues that could have an adverse impact on the outcome of the litigation. So we would submit that the vulnerable person ought not to be in that position, and there should be a range of options that people can choose from. There should also be a recognition that there may be issues of accessibility, inclusion, and te technical issues for people with mental health issues during an electronic hearing. And it's providing those choices that will enhance and not impede access to justice. The affected person ought not to have to justify their choice. Okay, and uh, Ruby, we have been discussing mental health tribunal proceedings, uh, but the issues we have identified, do they apply in the context of uh, proceedings of other tribunal, uh, tribunals where mental health uh, may, may play a role? Uh, and if so, can you identify some of those tribunals uh, and issues for us, please? Thank you so much for another great question. People with mental health issues appear before various tribunals, including the human rights tribunals, income maintenance, social benefits tribunals, landlord and tenant board tribunals, and immigration and refugee matters. In the human rights tribunal context, provincial human rights tribunals and the Canadian human rights tribunal, which is a federal tribunal, address discrimination complaints for people with mental health issues who experience discrimination in multiple contexts, such as employment, tenancy, hospitals, access to services, education, and et cetera. And people with mental health issues often experience difficulty making regular rent payments or with interpersonal relationships in some types of shared housing, or they may make noise complaints, for example, where the source of their concern is unrelated to their neighbors. So many people appearing before landlord and tenant tribunals may often have mental health issues and psychiatric histories and are most often not represented by counsel. Equally, people with mental health issues may face challenges in applying for and maintaining social assistance benefits due to the volume of paperwork involved or challenges navigating these very complex bureaucratic systems. They will often find themselves before social assistance tribunals as a result. And now people with immigration and refugee cases appearing before these tribunals, which consider their status, are also often survivors of complex traumas manifesting as acute mental health challenges. So therefore, each of these tribunals have a real working ability to accommodate and adjudicate fairly respecting the rights of people with psychiatric histories and ensuring they're able to meaningfully participate in the hearings. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ruby. And I just wanted to uh, let everyone know, I do see that there are some questions coming in and we will be answering them at the end. We will have 10 minutes to address these questions. Uh, so Anita, uh, you've appeared at many thousands of administrative tribunal hearings representing clients um, with mental health issues. And in chapter 19, actually of your new book, which I actually happen to have here with me, so in chapter 19 of your book, um, so it does address many practice tips for practicing mental health law generally. Uh, do you have any tips that are specific, though, to tribunal proceedings? Thanks, Maya, for that question. I think uh, everyone should know that that we all have the the book with us. So I'm put it in my face. Um, I'm just I'm very very proud of this book, and as some of you will know. Ruby and I are the general editors and we're co-authors of some of the chapters, but it is a product um, that's very um, close to my heart. We have nine uh, authors in total and uh, eight of us uh, are women in uh, criminal defense and uh, specializing in representing clients who have mental health issues. And I think that's a wonderful reflection of the changing face of the profession. So the book does address um, throughout the book, we address ethical and professional responsible representation of persons with mental health issues. Uh, in the book's last chapter, we get into some very specific practice issues and, and focus on both the practical 
and ethical challenges in representing clients with serious mental health issues generally. Ruby and I also discussed some of these issues in a podcast called Practicing Mental Health Law that is also available through Lexis Nexus on um, their podcast series, which is, I think, on Podbean. It's also free. I would encourage uh, everyone to tune in because it's a broader conversation that may otherwise be helpful. But the book chapter and the podcast pay particular attention to, uh, sorry, both the book a chapter and the podcast pay particular attention to direct and respectful, effective and trauma-informed communications with clients with mental health issues, as well as the cornerstone of um, the ethical imperative of client instructed advocacy. So I won't repeat those comments here. I'll suggest for our purposes now, breaking your obligations down into three areas when we're talking about tribunal litigation. So sort of chronologically, one, before the hearing, two, during the hearing, and as you may be able to guess, three, after the hearing. Um, so before the hearing, going into a tribunal proceeding, you have to know three things really well. I like to say know the record, know the law, and know your client. And I imagine this is probably shared across all litigation forums, but in preparation for a mental health tribunal hearing, um, you really are required to review your client's hospital charts and entire psychiatric record and to know it really, really well. This can be a lot. Uh, in one case, uh, for our 10 hour legal aid maximum tariff authorization, we received 81,000 pages of electronic records to review. So that disclosure in a sense can be overwhelming, um, but it's disclosure no different from a criminal case and you must know the case against your client. Knowing the law means being aware of binding appellate jurisprudence and precedent, becoming familiar with the informal precedent of the cases of the tribunal that you're appearing before and Importantly, in tribunal litigation, you have to make sure you know the rules of practice of the specific board that you're appearing before, because they all have different specific deadlines for exchanging or finding documents, time allotted for hearings. They have their own unique scheduling practices and so on. And finally, it goes without saying, hopefully, but um, you never know. You've got to know your client. You have to meet with your client. You have to make sure you understand their instructions, experiences, and perspective, as well as what they will need to be able to participate meaningfully in the proceedings, whether to accommodate specific needs or just health breaks, in addition, obviously, to interpretation needs and possible communications barriers that need to be addressed. All these things are important to keep in mind before, during, and after the hearing. Before the hearing, you must be fully prepared to address the case both on the facts and the law. During the hearing, you must engage fully with the process and only conduct yourself in accordance with your client's instructions. It's not appropriate, as, as we sometimes do very unfortunately see, to just agree with whatever position is being advanced by the hospital or the psychiatrist or the crown against your client, unless of course your client agrees and supports that position. But even if you personally believe that, um, that what, what the state actors are suggesting is the outcome that would be in your client's best interest, what you believe really just doesn't matter. And that's perhaps the most important thing to keep in mind in this practice area. It shouldn't have to be said these things ought to be obvious because they're obvious professional conduct and professional responsibility basics. Unfortunately, there is a real risk of paternalism in this area of law where lawyers can easily fall prey to thinking they're doing something to help a client by not following the client's instructions, which may not be in their own best interest. And finally, after the hearing, you must make sure that your client is aware of their right to appeal. Um, in this practice area, I am endlessly uh, shocked at how few lawyers advise their clients of their statutory right to appeal, whether it's funded by legal aid, whether you think they're going to win or lose, their statutory right to appeal a decision that affects their liberty is something that you must inform them about. Um, 
many lawyers don't do this. And indeed, they may not be aware of the appeal rights or statutory limitations for appealing from a mental health tribunal's decision. There are often, though, very broad statutory rights of appeal available, but also on incredibly short deadlines. So you must advise your client about this, and you must also assist them in appealing by filing that notice of appeal to safeguard that tight limitation period if they instruct you to do so. So that was a mouthful. But I should adopt Ruby's approach of saying thank you when I'm done answering the question. So thank you, Maya. I'm done with that question. Thank you, Anita <laughs> and uh, Ruby. Uh, so you have published widely and participated in training various uh, tribunals on best practices in adjudicating where mental health is an issue. Uh, what tips do you offer to um, the tribunals who must hear and decide these sometimes difficult cases uh, every day? Thanks so much, Maya. A shared goal of the justice system is providing bias-free hearings, particularly where vulnerable parties' charter-protected rights are an issue. At every hearing of a tribunal considering mental health matters, a person's autonomy or liberty is at stake. And respectful adjudication requires the use of sensitive and inclusive language, culturally competent and culturally conscious, bias-free adjudication demonstrated through fairness in the proceedings themselves. It also requires accommodation of the needs of the individual to afford them the ability to participate meaningfully in the proceedings. I would say the first thing to get right is the use of respectful and inclusive language. Thank you. Okay, well, on the issue of language, Ruby, why is language important when dealing with individuals with mental health issues? Every person experiencing mental health issues will face their own unique and often complicating challenges when interacting with healthcare and justice system. So particular phrases and the use of labeling language can exacerbate the prevalence of stigma, stereotyping, and implicit bias. Words are powerful and have immediate impact. It's important to recognize the discrimination against people with mental health issues more historically. And the experience is both of systemic and individual discrimination. Stereotypes about people with mental health issues could include dangerousness, cognitive impairment with and an ability to care for self or make appropriate decisions. And the individual has likely experienced trauma and loss of liberty and autonomy. They may have also experienced involuntary committal, forced treatment and restraint. They may have likely have had their rights to make decisions about treatment and finances removed. They may have likely have heard derogatory slurs or have been labeled with diagnoses. And many do not ascribe to this medical model of illness, but perceive their issues or crisis to be more socially constructed through impacted by social factors such as a history of poverty, homelessness, life events that are catastrophic, that are minimally contributing factors, but may be the cause and trigger of mental health issues. People who live with mental health issues often have their voices ignored. Uh, thank you, Ruby. And still, uh, my next question is for you, and it's still on the same uh, topic. What is the most appropriate language to use when discussing mental health issues? Thank you so much, Maya. And as we recognize in the book, language is cons constantly evolving. It's socially constructed. Language creates power, and some words and terms are extremely triggering. It's important to choose to use language that limits the risk of re-traumatization and reduces stigma or stereotyping. The use of person-first language, example, a person experiencing a mental health issue or a person in crisis. This is incredibly important in ensuring an intersectional approach to legal proceedings in the adjudication process from start to finish. And the best practice is to familiarize yourself, oneself, with the language the person prefers to use to describe themselves, their diagnoses, their treatment, and their life outlook. We must all be aware of our own implicit biases, and that includes parties, counsel, and tribunal members presiding over cases that involve mental health issues. Thank you. And Ruby, how does intersectionality factor into all of this? 
we recognize as law and society continues to marginalize people with mental health issues, this is further complicated when issues of race, culture, ethnicity, gender, class, disability, sexual orientation, and other factors are involved. In a legal context, an intersectional approach enables one to consider the historic, social, political, and cultural context, which contributes to the experiences and the unique barriers an individual makes face. We recognize that ind Indigenous racial, and racialized people, along with people from other equity-seeking communities with mental health issues, confront a higher likelihood of being misdiagnosed, a higher likelihood of experiencing seclusion, restraint, and emergency psychiatric medication, and a potential loss of their charter-protected liberty interests while in the mental health system. So for instance, language and communication barriers may result in Indigenous and racialized people with mental health issues being deemed as non-compliant and incapable. Racialized people and Indigenous people with mental health issues have reported that their intangible qualities such as their accent, mannerisms, body language, gestures, and demeanor have meant they are perceived as less credible. Other consequences may include misdiagnosis, privileges within the hospital being taken away, and increased use of seclusion and restraint. And multiple sources of discrimination can be faced by the same client who has mental health issues when coupled with race, gender, sexual orientation or expression, and, and other factors. And this can have an accumulative and often devastating impact on the person and their freedom. Thank you, so uh, thank you Ruby. Uh, but what is meant by cultural competence or cultural humi humility in the adjudication context? Thank you. So adjudicators must be mindful and aware of the varied conceptions of mental health. So although some symptoms of mental illness and mental health are similar across cultures, its manifestations and how people express psychiatric symptoms may vary with race, ethnicity, and culture. So Western definitions of mental health cannot be applied homogeneously, and cultural conceptions of mental health are influenced by the severe stigma associated with mental illness and mental health amongst ethno-racial communities, for instance, and other communities. So under, understanding the stigma associated with mental health in some cultures and the cultural stigma related to the reluctance to actually seek assistance when experiencing a crisis. It's important to be mindful of perpetuating stereotypes and adopting a trauma-informed intersectional approach. It's also important to ensure that there is access to culturally appropriate treatment options and programs. For instance, psychotropic medications may not be preferred over culturally appropriate community care and supports. So throughout this process, it's really important to be self-reflective and to increase education and training around these issues. Uh, and uh, Ruby, do the same concerns apply as well to written decisions? Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's especially important to be aware that some of those decisions may not even be understood by the client if they're not translated <clears throat> post-hearing process. So thank you so much, Maya, for all of those excellent questions. Well, thank you, Ruby. And Anita, now I have a question for you. Are there tips that you would suggest to mental health tribunals in terms of strategies to manage uh, behavior and accommodations in the healing room? I feel, Maya, like I've shortchanged you. Ruby appears a lot more grateful for your questions than I am. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and be more appreciative. So thank you. This is a very good question. Um, you know, you would think that a lot of what I'm about to say and what we've been discussing would be common sense, but having you know over 30 year career representing individuals with mental health issues exclusively, having appeared at you know 10,000 or more tribunal hearings, you know, it never ceases to amaze me how ordinary respectful courtesies go out the window when my client um, has a mental health issue or is said said to be. Um, uh, in crisis. So, um, you know, in terms of how these proceedings are handled, specific to the individual participant, it might help if the proceeding commenced by uh, the adjudicator asking if the, if the client needs anything before the hearing starts. A simple, ordinary courtesy. Do you need a, a paper and a pencil to take notes? Do you need water? Do you have water there? Um, 
asking the individual if taking a break at a specified time might be helpful to them. For example, a smoke break. We, we talk about this in the book, but you know, a preponderance of individuals with serious mental health issues, particularly if they're on antipsychotic medications, uh, smoke cigarettes, they're cigarette smokers. And the pressure of not having that cigarette will you know, make the difference between a smooth hearing and a difficult one. So do they need medications? Do they need food? Do they need to walk around? Do they need a break? In, in terms of structure, clearly and plainly setting out what is going to happen, who does what and when, and uh, particularly that they will get their chance to ask questions and to testify if they choose to do so and when that will happen. Um, asking, especially if the person is not represented by counsel, if they have any questions about the process before the hearing begins. Um, but probably the most important thing is to try not to rush the process or the person. This means trying to set aside enough time for hearings to accommodate lengthier matters. Criminal courts that specialize in hearing mental health matters have built-in buffer zones, uh, recognizing that these hearings may take longer than average. Mental health tribunal matters are scheduled on very tight timelines. It is largely this pressure of the clock ticking and trying to race against that clock that escalates the stress in the hearing room as parties try desperately to finish the hearing before the next one starts. So that I think is probably the biggest issue. Okay, and uh, I need to like. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, <laughs> Um, but uh, so I expect that there may be situations, though, that develop within a hearing that require intervention by the adjudicator. In that case, what are some examples of strategies that you've tried or that uh, you have seen others try uh, that do and do not work in managing uh, the reactions of persons with mental health issues uh, to the evidence or proceedings when they're stressful? So some of the things that work are listening actively to the individual and the concerns about the process that they might be expressing, um, repeating and reinforcing information about what to expect at the hearing, reassuring the person um, that either they or their lawyer will have that opportunity to test the evidence or reply to it with their own witness or testimony. So for example, just saying, you can expect the doctor to say things that you disagree with but the doctor will be asked questions about this in cross-examination because it's very difficult for someone who's already in crisis or has a psychiatric history to sit through two hours, you know, most of which is somebody going over the worst moments of their life. And, and um, it can be devastating, particularly the way that sometimes testimony um, comes out in terms of highlighting negative things. Uh, or difficult experiences or the trauma, repeating the trauma the person has experienced. Um, so asking the person to take notes of what they disagree with or points they think are important and setting aside that time for a break to discuss with counsel before they have to decide whether or not to give evidence, for example, uh, or before closing submissions. Uh, you know, I always ask at tribunal hearings to speak with my client when the sort of case against them is closed to see whether they want to testify, as we all know is their right. I get a remarkable amount of pushback from tribunals about why we didn't make that decision uh, before we heard the evidence. And of course, of course, the client has the right to determine in the moment once the evidence has actually come in. And of course, that conversation is mandatory for us to have to discharge our ethical obligations. But administrative tribunals are sometimes bothered that you want to obtain those instructions in that moment. So these are some of the tensions in these types of proceedings. What does not work um, is trying to control the person by being aggressive with the person, by shouting at the person, by threatening the person. Some, you know, some hearings will open with, if you interrupt, you'll be excluded. I think you know, starting a, a legal proceeding with a threat is not going to work. So uh, those are some of the things that really don't work. You know, um, threatening they'll be thrown out if they don't behave is often going to escalate rather than de-escalate. 
Now, Maya, I know the time I see we've got 10 minutes left. So we were going to talk about what a tribunal should do if the if the individual doesn't show up or if they leave part way through the hearing. But all of this stuff is in our book. And given that you tell me there's questions building up, perhaps we should just move to them. There is actually quite a bit. So I'm going to start by uh, reading uh, what we have here. So. So not all administrative tribunals act similarly where mental health and physical issues are involved. An example is the Veterans Review Appeal Board, uh, VRAB, which has experienced numerous challenges at adversely affecting veterans during the past decade. So I think that was more like a comment as opposed to a question. Mm -hmm. But then, um, so we have Jennifer Schaefer is asking, Ruby, can you send the link to the paper reference by you? Um, I think you mentioned at the beginning early on that paper, so they were wondering if you can send them uh, that link. Um, Absolutely. Yes, and it's at the it was published in 2020 at the Windsor Yearbook of Access to Justice. So I will definitely send that link. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, drop it in the chat, Ruby. Um, how do clients ordinarily encounter you and retain your services? Are your services paid for through Legal Aid Ontario or comparable organizations? I guess I'll take that one because nobody pays yeah. Ruby except her university. Um, so how do I get retained and how do I get paid in the in Ontario, in the um, Civil Consent and Capacity Board Mental Health Tribunal context? I would most often receive a call from a rights advisor who's mandated to meet with someone who's been detained involuntarily or they've lost the right to make decisions about their treatment. That if the person wants to apply to the consent and capacity board, the rights advisor will provide them with a list of lawyers that legal aid has impaneled as qualified to assist them. The person may choose me off the list or Word of mouth, you know, if I do a good job for a person in a hospital, they'll tell their friends on the unit. I think that's how I, you know, sort of my entire career has evolved between, um, you know, word of mouth by client. Uh, and then in terms of how do I get paid, uh, you know, not enough. <laughs> uh, in Ontario, though, relative to other provinces and territories, we are lucky. We have a due to care system. We have private bar council of choice certificates. And most people uh, in the mental health system are eligible for legal aid because they are on ODSP and most of them meet the low eligibility criteria. Um, and in the forensic system, uh, you know, clients just retain me. They hear about me. They, they don't get rights advice. Uh, so they just retain me. And, it's, and, and it, my, my work is 100% legal aid. I can't remember the last time our trust account, you know, was noticed. <laughs> so it's legal aid. There are no other organizations who would uh, who would pay me. But if you think there is one, you can drop that in the chat because we're always interested in hearing about other organizations who might pay us. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. The next question is: What is the def what is the definition of in crisis, especially the meaning of in crisis during a court proceeding? Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll start and then I'll, I'll leave it to Ruby to take this one on. Uh, I guess, you know, in terms of the language that we use, so often the, the language of person in crisis uh, for me does uh, evolve from um, inquest work that I've done in terms of police shooting deaths of persons in crisis um, is, you know, a, a phrase that that's developed in the inquest litigation and in the the uh, community crisis team training. Um, it replaced police's parlance earlier of emotionally disturbed persons, which prior to that was MI for mentally ill persons. That was apparently understood to be myocardial infarctions and, and people sent ambulances for heart attacks. So I, the persons in crisis language comes from there, but um, you know, having given this a lot of thought through various organizations where I've worked, um, it's it to me. It's uh, it indicates you know uh, an extreme uh, state uh, in sort of emotional balance. Um, so um, 
I prefer it to the language psychiatry would put on the same uh, moment in the person's life, which would be overtly psychotic, for example. Uh, so that's what I mean by by in crisis uh, when when someone is um, experiencing some some extreme of emotion in the moment. Um, that's what I think I meant when I said it in in this context. Ruby. Thank you so much, Anita. Uh, that's a really great question. I know um, in the context that I was kind of discussing was also around for those people who are experiencing mental health issues and may be extremely traumatized um, when our clients are experiencing involuntary detention and along with that, any types of consent and capacity issues having that trauma, but we also mentioned it in terms of interacting with other tribunals, not mental health tribunals, but other ones such as in the human rights context and so on, um, and likely really experiencing charter protected liberty interests where they're at stake, like experiencing a loss of autonomy or loss of liberty. So really understanding that issue around being facing trauma in multiple different ways. Um, and you know, it's, it's important to recognize, as Anita mentioned, like we're, we're not using that kind of medical label, but instead we're saying, here's this person experiencing trauma. They may also be experiencing social determinants of health, such as homelessness, such as poverty, such as systemic racism, discrimination, colonialism. So just understanding that kind of as a more comprehensive, holistic issue of what crisis can mean for an individual. And it can, it can be very different depending on their own lived experiences and their own, um, circumstances and the social factors that are implicating that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ruby. Now, um, the next question I have here is, is it practical to have all court proceedings dealing with mental disability with inquisitorial rather than adversarial? Um, I'll, well, I'll start on that. and I. We only have about three minutes left and I, we have a, a really a lot of questions I know to building up, I was trying to comb through them too. So um, so the question is, sorry, would it be practical or realistic to have court proceedings all, that are inquisitorial? Um, yes. So, well, first of all, I don't agree that proceedings of the civil mental health tribunals are or ought to be inquisitorial. <laughs> Um, the tribunal, at least in Ontario, takes a different view. Uh, so I think, I think at the moment, for example, the Consent and Capacity Board would say, and I suspect trains uh, its members, that it is a, a board of inquiry or it has inquisitorial powers or an inquisitorial role. I think that works against uh, our clients and I don't think it's intended. So I personally respectfully disagree. The Criminal code review boards are inquisitorial. We know that because the criminal code says so. Um, specifically, in a section indicates that they have the board, uh, the powers of a board of inquiry, and that that's appropriately so. But anyways, the way it is, um, is it you know is it practical or is it ethical? Is it fair? I think um, depending on the context, it's necessary. And I think in the in the criminal review board context, it is necessary. Uh, for a host of reasons. So there's no way out. And that doesn't mean the evidence is not being tested by the accused or their, their lawyer. So it, it doesn't mean that there's not a, an element of the adversarial system there. It just means that the tribunal has additional obligations and that, that the onus to make the necessary factual findings is really on the tribunal. And that protects the accused because if the accused doesn't show up or doesn't have a lawyer, somebody has got to do the digging um, in terms of protecting that person's liberty. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but um, it's the best I'm, I'm going to do with it anyway. It's a good question. Though. So we have one minute and there's uh, we still have more questions coming in, but uh, can victims of criminal acts speak at these tribunals? Uh, so in terms of the criminal code review boards, uh, victims have the right to present their victim state, uh, impact statements in any way they wish. They can read them, they can attend, um, they can send them in. So their the victim, um, participation has been expanded a lot over the years at review board hearings. 
Um, they have, victims have notice rights, you know, um, all kinds of rights. And, um, you know, with questionable benefit, quite frankly, to the victims who do participate, because ultimately very little that they're permitted to tell us, which is um, how the the index offense, the commission of the offense has affected them or what loss or harm they've sustained as a result, um, ultimately is not going to have an impact in law on the decision of the tribunal. Um, so I think victims find it very, very difficult to attend these hearings and are frustrated ultimately by the, the lack of effect of, of their attendance on the result but they, they have significant procedural rights now. And that's, that's evolved over the last, I would say 10 to 15 years with a number of amendments. Um, so I am noting the time. Uh, we still have lots of questions, uh, but I mean, I think uh, Anita and Ruby, uh, People can find your email addresses, and I think it's okay with you if they email you directly and they ask you <laughs> their sure. questions. Yeah, we we always knew it was a risk that we might run out of, of time, and we know that all your questions are important. We're sorry that we mm -hmm. can't get to all of them, um, but we can't go. We've we've gone over the hour, so we're going to have to stop here. I wanted to say genuinely, I've been teasing you throughout Maya, but really, thank you so much for giving us um, your precious time to to help us navigate through today and thank you ruby for you know 15 years of uh, being my partner in crime and all the work that we've done together and um to the many many hundreds of you that showed up today and registered for this event thank you so much for your interest and support and i hope that you'll find this helpful and that um you'll put it to good use and in, in if you're participating in administrative law proceedings where mental health is an issue thank you so much Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me.